pray over this message, and we just give this morning to you. In your name we pray. Amen. And all of that, I'm realizing, I didn't introduce myself, so we'll start there. Good morning, church family. Welcome to Seal of Covenant, whether you're watching online, watching here in person. My name is Katie Hutchinson. I'm the youth pastor here at Seal of Cove. Um, and this week, we're continuing a sermon series that we started out with last week, and we are talking about the covenant affirmations. There are these six different statements that help define the DNA of what a covenant church is. So if you have wandered in here relatively recently and you're wondering, where does the name Sila Covenant come from? Um, this is helping us to just define, this is what it means to be a part of the covenant church family. And what an awesome time to be going through this as we're Circul- like circulating through leadership changes and just reminding us this is the mission of Seal of Covenant Church. If you missed last week's message, I highly encourage you to go back either on YouTube or Facebook. We live stream every week. We had our wonderful guest speaker, Cesar Silva, and he spoke to the first ob- uh, affirmation, which is observance of the centrality of the word of God. So emphasizing that everything that we do as Christians should always be driven by biblical truth and foundation, what we can read in the Bible, that we gain knowledge and insight, wisdom and, courage- and encouragement from his word. So, the scripture tells us that the truth, which guides the Christian life and helps us understand how we're supposed to live in a secular world, that's what Cesar was talking about last week. So again, I encourage you, go and watch it. This is a six-part series, and they all kind of work cohesively to let you know this is what makes our church our church. So today I get to carry on the series and discuss the second affirmation, which I think is a perfect follow-up because it's understanding the necessity of new birth. The idea of being made new in Christ. The difference between being a Christ follower by words, saying I'm a Christian, and being a Christ follower by our action, what we do, what we say in the world around us. So we first need to understand the word which is written, the revelation of complete truth, to understand the idea of new birth in the first place. Because the covenant church states the view of scripture as follows. The holy scripture, the Old and New Testament, is the word of God and the only perfect rule for faith, doctrine, and conduct. So like all of the covenant affirmations, the one we're looking at here today is rooted in the word of God. It is rooted in scripture. And all of the affirmations were carefully chosen to help reflect and guide a movement of people, helping to equip them to serve as the hands and feet of Christ in the world around us. And not unlike the other affirmations, this this one, talking about new birth, understanding the necessity of why we need to be newly born, newly made as a creation of Christ, is cited again and again in Scripture as an essential piece to the holistic Christian walk. And we'll peek at some of those Scriptures today and focus on three major points that are going to kind of help drive the point that I'm trying to make in the message. So let's just dive into it. The first point of today's message, if you're taking notes, is that new birth is necessary to our salvation. Our salvation comes from Christ alone and his sacrifice on the cross. We accept that salvation when we accept Jesus into our lives as the one true Savior, the only one who could allow us guidance into a relationship with the Father, into a life eternal with the Father. And we do this by agreeing with and acknowledging the fact that Christ died for our sins, and that is the salvation of our souls. By nothing else can we be saved, but only that. That agreeing to give our lives to Christ is what enables us to live eternally with God the Father. This is a direct quote from the covenant affirmation document. It says, Conversion can be defined as the act by which a person turns with repentance and faith from sin to God. Conversion involves a conscious rejection of the life of sin and involves a commitment of faith. Eternal life is not given through assent to creeds alone, but through a personal commitment to Jesus Christ. So what does this whole new birth thing even mean, and why is it necessary to our salvation? We were all born once, right? I think we can all agree and jive with that. We're all sitting in this room as a product of some sort of childbirth experience. But to be newly born is something different. But the same way when a baby is brought into the world with a blank slate, not knowing the world of possibility that sits in front of them, not really coming into their own personality and developing these unique things that make them, they're just new. This is what the concept of new birth looks like. 
It's essentially starting over. It's not because everything that existed in our life before that still happened, but it's a blank slate as baby Christians, a world of possibility in front of us in which we commit to a life with Christ and, and what that would look like. And with this blank slate, Christ expects us to make something of it, to be made new, to, to be born again. It means to transform from our old life and what it was and then commit to our, ourselves to a new life in Christ through healthy obedience to his word. Discipline and commitment to what the word tells us is, is true righteous living. See, without new birth, we cannot experience our salvation. Yes, we all have the capacity and opportunity to accept salvation at any point in time. That's always been available to us. But being made new and committing to a life after a new birth is necessary to our walk with Christ because it's necessary to the mission of Christ. It's the being different that is necessary to our salvation. There are three short verses I want to read to you. We'll break it down, examine, and understand why we need to be born again and experience salvation as that first point. So I'll be reading out of the NLT translation if you have your phone with the app or you have a Bible in front of you. So the first verse I'm going to read, it's John chapter 3, verse 3. It tells us, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And then the second verse is John 14, chapter 6. It says, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And then the third verse is Acts 4.12. It tells us, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. So what these three verses tell us is that, one, we do not receive salvation on our own by just being good, doing good deeds. As much as that sounds great, and I think I know plenty of people who wouldn't consider themselves a Christ follower who are good people, I think that's just the innate thing that God puts in us, hoping that we'll get there. But we don't get salvation just by being good. No one goes to the Father except through Jesus. It's by the sacrifice of Christ alone and and recognizing that sacrifice that we are afforded the opportunity to live eternally with with God in heaven. And then two, if God is given no other name by which we can be saved, then Jesus is setting the standard of our salvation. So in John chapter 3, verse 3, when it says, when Jesus speaks and says, unless you are born again and you cannot, then you cannot see the kingdom of God, then we have to take the whole new birth thing super seriously because the person, the man who sets the standard of our salvation is the one telling us right here, you can't get that salvation without being different, by being born again. His spoken word tells us that we must be born once more, a regeneration of our spirit to be more in tune with the spirit of God and be changed and change the world around us. I think sometimes as Christians, salvation is kind of viewed as this get out of jail free card. We've all played Monopoly, right? The little orange card, you can cash it in. You don't have to wait three turns to buy more properties. And then I think sometimes we usually think of it as a renewable get out of jail free card. It's all right, I've got, I've got a stack of these things. Don't worry about it. But that's not the point of salvation. Salvation isn't, is meant to transform us. It should propel us into a life where we long to transform. True and honest recognition of salvation warrants a response and a reverence of Christ. We respect him so much in his sacrifice for us so that we can only show that by showing an authentic change in our being, being reborn out of respect and reverence for what Christ did. Our way of showing we mean what we say when we're going to follow him. We can't show him respect if we cash in on a card that says, it's all right, God, you still love me. I did that thing, but you'll still love me. And while God doesn't expect complete transformation all at once, he he knows that we are going to mess up and, and we're messy people. It's a human condition called sin, and he knows that we have it. He does still hold us to a high standard. He is proud when we follow him. He's disappointed and hurt when we turn away from him. But he gives us space to check our hearts as well. Some people would call it their conscience or their Jiminy Cricket. My husband and I just saw the Puss in Boots movie this weekend, and it was really funny because one of the characters had a funny little Jiminy Cricket character. But that's why it's just stuck in my head. But... A lot of us think we might have a conscience telling us, man, you shouldn't do that. 
I don't think that's what's best for you, but newsflash, when you're following Jesus, when you give into a Christian life, it's not just your conscience. It's not like something you're saying. It's something Jesus is saying. He's saying, you know what? You don't need to cash in on a get-out-of-jail-free card if you just follow me. Again, it's necessary for us to be made different. We can't be the same person that we were before we said yes. We only have access to the Father through Christ and his sacrifice. And his sacrifice demands a responsive action, not just sitting there and waiting and hoping something's going to happen. One in which we say, I'm choosing to be different from who I was because it's God's best for me. I want to share a quick analogy to help kind of illustrate this first point. So a man walks in, he's, he's very unhealthy, let's say he's incredibly overweight. He walks into the doctor's office and he is given some bad news. John, if you don't make some serious changes in your life, you won't live much longer. You need to adjust your eating habits, you need to get more active, you need to drink more water, sleep better. You're not looking great and it's not going to look great if you don't take things seriously. So John replies to the doctor, Doc, you've opened my eyes. I want a chance at a healthy life. I will leave this office and get to it. I'll eat better. I'll make a plan to exercise more often. I'll get eight hours of sleep at night. I'll drink more water. All of the things that you're telling me to do, I'll do it because I want to get my life in check and I want a chance to live. If John leaves that appointment after telling his doctor he's going to get things under control, Because he truly meant it at the time, right? When you hear news like that, you mean it. I don't want to die. I want to live. But then he decides to just keep eating fast food every meal, and he never goes for a walk or plans to get a gym membership. He doesn't drink any water. He's still not sleeping at night. Even if he really meant it at the time, even if his intentions were there and he thought, you know what, tomorrow I'll get better, the next time he goes to the doctor, he's not going to receive good news. His doctor isn't going to be proud. He's going to say, what happened? You had a chance, but you're, you're still failing. But if John leaves that appointment, he decides he's going to incorporate a lot more fresh fruits and vegetables into his diet. He goes for a mile walk every day, or he gets that gym membership, all of the necessary things. The next time he goes to the doctor, he's going to notice a change, and so is his doctor, because he's going to return to that office and hear, wow, you really made a change. You made an effort to make your life better. You have an opportunity to live. These test results are really positive. They are in your favor because of all the work that you've put in. You're going to turn your life around. We are like John because our diagnosis is death as a result of our sin. We cannot live based on who we are in our human condition. And our prescribing doctor is Jesus. We can look Jesus in the face at the time of that diagnosis and say, Lord, I'm going to change. I want to change. I want to keep living. I don't want to keep living life the way that I've been living it, but I want to live life the way you want me to because I know it's what's best for me. I know that it's what's going to bring me true, healthy life. And just like that analogy, we can look God in the eyes, say all of those things, and then just go right back to the normal lives we were living, never paying mind to what God's best is for us truly. Well, it's okay because God's love is unconditional. It's not that bad. I can keep messing up. He loves me. But new birth is necessary to our salvation. So why would we look God in the face, say we're going to do something, and then not? It's not good for our health. No one can enter the kingdom unless they've been reborn and truly transformed, and they can only do that through Jesus. Or we can choose to do what the doctor has ordered. We can change and allow the love of Jesus to permeate our beings and drive us to a new way of living. One that's selfish, selfless, not selfish, goodness gracious, righteous, holy in the eyes of God. One that helps us to get back to our health, back to what God had intended for humanity in the first place. One that is disciplined, where we dedicate ourselves to being immersed in the word on a regular basis, picking up our Bibles, not just because we have to or, or, you know, we're fulfilling a checklist, but because we really want to know finding a faith-centered community, living a life of prayer, serving and loving others, as well as so much more, living a life of discipline because we know if we make these changes, we have a long and beautiful life ahead of us, one that is eternally spent with Jesus. Because as Christ said, unless we are born again, we cannot reach the kingdom of God. 
being born again is so much more than just saying we're going to give our life to him. It's actually living like we mean it. It's understanding that without our intention and commitment to being a new creation, we haven't lived a life worthy of the salvation that he offers to us. The second point in today's message is to new birth is an ongoing process. I think a lot of people tie new birth to the act of giving one's life to Christ, which isn't totally off. Obviously, that's a big piece of it. We need to first say yes before we understand what comes next. But there's a difference between the moment in which you say yes to Jesus and everything that comes after. And I think it's important that we also note the difference between salvation and everything that comes after, which is a process that we call sanctification. It's a big kind of Christian word. It's it's everything that comes after saying yes to Jesus. See, salvation is that one-time event. It's the moment you give your life to Christ. It's the moment that you agreed to a life of following him. And salvation can look different for all of us. I think some of us may have heard or maybe we have our own personal experience of some sort of wild salvation story. People who faced near-death experiences and drove them to the point of submission, lived a life so far off from Jesus and then met him and boom, everything changed. When I first started interning at the first church I worked at, my, the pastor that I interned for had an incredibly wild salvation story. He was facing time in prison, eight years in a federal prison, and then he gave his life to Jesus, and someone was delivered to him who, who basically wiped the slate clean. He didn't face any serious jail time. It was incredible. Only these insane things that happen when we say yes to Jesus. And then some of us may be thinking, my salvation story is pretty normal. I can't pinpoint an exact time, or maybe I can. I might have been a kid in Sunday school, and I rose my hand, and I said yes to Jesus for the first time with my little Dixie cup full of water and the graham crackers, and that's totally okay. Mine is relatively similar. I was a girl who grew up going to church. I don't know when the first time I said yes to Jesus was. There's all of these salvation stories, anything in between that spectrum. But the important thing to note when we are talking about salvation is that it's only one part of the deal and it's an important part of the deal. That's a big part of our story to say, who, who was I before I gave my life to Christ? And, and what was this moment in which things changed? But it's just a fraction of the whole. And exists wholly because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. The bigger part, at least on our end of the things, our side of the deal, is the sanctification process. Because it's more than a one-time event, it's a lifelong process of consciously choosing to live life with Jesus. Waking up each morning and deciding to be different than you were before you gave your life to Christ. It's a roller coaster ride of making good decisions and, and feeling content about your Christianity. Not that you, you do the decision, you make that choice because it'll look good. Sometimes I think that's our motivation, but even just living a life with Christ feels good. You feel free, and then it's the roller coaster, it's the down, and then making, you know, those not-so-good decisions and, and asking God for, your, for his forgiveness because you know you messed up. Sanctification is never done in an instant. We don't become perfect and without sin at the time of our salvation. The Bible tells us that only when we meet Christ face-to-face will we be made truly perfect. So he's not expecting perfection from the, from the get-go. He knows we're not going to make it there. It's not like some magic switch is flipped that makes us go from who we were to a completely different person. It's an ongoing process, a commitment to walk with Christ, a commitment to growth for the rest of your life. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24, it says, Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Quitting anything cold turkey that's been a long-time habit, something that has made you comfortable, is grueling, and it comes with challenges. The Lord sees that, and he recognizes it. The Lord sees and understands our humanity more than we ever will because he created it. He knows that we're flawed, And when something has been corrupted, he knows that it takes time and effort and a lot of hard work to get rid of that corruption. Patience and hard work and effort to fix what was once wrong. And in this sense, a conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit to change how we speak and think and act. 
recognition that we can't nor should we try to be doing this thing on our own because we're told in the word that we don't have to. Again, centrality of the word of God. Jesus tells us, you don't have to do this all on your own. And that's why in the scripture, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, it tells us, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. It can be troubling to leave behind what we once knew as comfort, the people or the habits, the places and the choices. They were things that once made us feel whole or maybe even at this immediate point in time you can think of something you should probably be letting go of that makes you feel whole, a a false sense of wholeness and identity. But leaving behind the hard stuff is the test of our steadfastness and our ability to rely on the Lord, what our faith is, how big is your faith. To lay everything at his feet, feet, to ask for strength, to ask for help. It shows commitment to our choice to follow him. And we can rejoice that someday when we meet God face to face, it will be complete. We will be made whole. You will be perfect and complete, needing nothing to meet Jesus face to face. It doesn't matter. We will be made whole. I'm going to use another analogy and quick trigger warning. I am going to snakes. I'm not saying it because I think snakes are groovy. I don't. They're really gross and squirmy, Um, but the analogy works for this, so just bear with me. Snakes shed their skin four to 12 times a year. For this sake, we're just going to say it's 12 times a year, so let's say a a a shake. A snake sheds its skin once a month, and they shed their skin for two basic reasons. I'm not a herpetologist, so there might be more. So if you're, you are a snake expert, I am sorry if I am butchering this, but this is what the internet told me and I'm rocking with it. One, as snakes grow in size, their skin doesn't grow with them. So when we're humans, we don't shed our skin. It just keeps growing with us. It's pretty amazing to think that when we start as an infant and have very little skin, we grow up and we're covered in the stuff and it's a lot more than what we started with. But as snakes grow in size, their, their skin doesn't do that. Instead, they develop a new layer of skin that fits their body. That was something that I learned on the internet this week. Pretty amazing. The second reason that a snake sheds its old skin is because they usually have parasites. They get forced into a, a shedding cycle because they have something trying to infiltrate their body and kill them and make them sick. And so the snakes decide, you know, it's time to shed my skin. It doesn't fit. It's a little too snug. I need to get a new pair of pants, that kind of thing. If they keep the old stuff, they could get sick and die, so their body tells them, we got to get something new. But the thing about this, and again, not a snake expert, but there are people who spend hours and hours researching this stuff. I don't know why. They can tell you that snakes don't like shedding, that it's really itchy and uncomfortable, so they usually have these like incubation chamber things for snakes to make the process more comfortable, but it's something the snakes have to do. Their body is making them do it. Even though it's an itchy, unpleasant sensation, they do it because somewhere in their little snake mind, whatever that looks like, their little snake brain, it tells them, When you get to the end of this, you will be so much more comfortable. Life will be way better than it was with that tiny little snake skin that had little bugs trying to infiltrate. It's going to be better. New birth in the process of sanctification is a lot like a snake shedding its skin. Here's where we go. This is why I'm talking about snakes. It's committing to the uncomfortable mess of change in life. Whether that's multiple times a year, multiple times a month, sometimes even multiple times a day, deciding that you are willing to deal with the uncomfortable change in life of leaving the old behind and accepting the new. It's understanding that there is a better life than what we had before if we can just stick it out and be patient with the process. We don't need those old pants. We want the new pants. Changing and growing to fit whichever season God had us in. And sometimes getting rid of the skin that has the parasites, those things that impede our growth. What are the parasites in your life that you think God's been telling you, you know what, it's time, it's time to shed that skin. 
the things that are trying to steal the life that God has for you, the one that brings true happiness, that brings true fulfillment and joy, the best life that you could ever hopefully live in this, in all in front of us, out of all of the things we could do in our life. That is the best option. The word says in Matthew 7, verses 13 through 14, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad. And its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. We live in a society that will tell us the ways of sinful or secular living are okay. That everyone's doing it. If we drink too much, it's okay. Everybody does it. Everyone goes and gets drunk. It's okay if we're a little promiscuous. People do it at least once in their life, right? People are doing it. Smoke weed and get high. Who cares? It's illegal. It's, it's legal here. Everybody's doing it. No one goes through the narrow gate because that one's hard. It's time consuming. You have to be careful and work harder. You miss out on all the fun. We're all going through the wide gate. You should do it too. But notice how the scripture told us the wide gate leads to destruction. That giving into what the world wants you to give into is giving into destruction of your own life. And again, to backtrack to the message last week, the point of it, the affirmation we focused on, which was the centrality of the word of God, if we're going to call ourselves Christians, there's a reason why the Bible tells us to avoid these type of things. And to understand the why behind that is a completely different message. It's probably a different series breaking down why the Bible says certain things are, are taboo. It's probably a series of of coffee dates and all of that. So if you ever want to dive into that, we can get into that later. But as Christians who are dedicated to liking, likening ourselves to Christ, it's our job to commit to the mission of leaving our past lives behind. Accepting and facing the trials of life, going through that narrow gate, even though we we know it might be harder or it doesn't look as fun because everyone's going through that one. Because God is telling us the truth about the wide gate leading to destruction. Maybe not all at once, but over a long period of time, destruction to our lives, it leads to hell, a life without Christ, a life with no eternal Father in heaven, one where we are lacking and unhappy in, in the absolutely worst outcome we could just ever imagine in our entire lives. Absence of God, hell, destruction waits through the wide gate. It might be easier to travel through, but it's not a path that's worth taking. I've stood up here before and I've told snippets of my testimony before about being a girl who'd graduate high school and I thought I would leave Sela forever and, and never turn back. I had it all planned out. I was going to go down a certain career path. I was looking at med school, a, a marriage to someone I had dated all through high school. I had my basically my entire 10-year plan laid out in, in front of me, never really considering what God would lead me to. It was the easy life where I would have whatever I needed or wanted, except for the, spoiler alert, the one thing that I would actually make me feel like life had meaning. And then I went to a summer camp. It was called Collide Summer Camp in Medical Lake, Washington. And I had a face-to-face interaction with Jesus, which it felt like the first time I had ever encountered God. I had grown up a Christian my entire life and gone to church and heard all the stories at Sunday school, and it never clicked until that moment. The girl who grew up going to church, going through the motions, actually understood her faith for the first time ever. I heard the Lord call me into ministry in a a worship series. We were sitting at the front, and they had asked if we all wanted to be prayed for, and I just went off on my own, and I got down on my knees, and I heard God tell tell me I was going to go into youth ministry, and that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me because I was planning on going to medical school. And... Then I made the conscious decision to follow him, to actually do the thing, not just say I was doing it. I was going to be a blank slate from that point forward. I was a Christian by word when I showed up to camp, but when I heard that call, when I felt God speak to me, I left behind that whole just being a Christian by word. I became a Christian by call and action, and things changed. I left behind old friendships, people who weren't really living their best lives, not guiding me into a way to live my best life. I I left a five-year relationship, that boy I thought I was going to marry. 
habits of a lifestyle that didn't suggest I was a Jesus follower, even though I would have said I was. I changed my college major. I moved for college. I left for a Christian university. I moved back home from college. Mind you, all of this as a response to what God was calling me to. I didn't make these decisions on my own. Like I said, I didn't want to move back. I was still embarrassed, had a lot of pride about it. But I listened to God, and I heard, come home, and so I did. All while receiving disapproving comments from certain family members and peers, it was pretty difficult. I didn't like not receiving support from people who I thought loved me and would have loved me unconditionally. No matter what decision I made, it really hurt. And I also did what I felt like God was leading me to in my daily life. I read my Bible a lot more than I ever had, not because I felt like I had to, but because I wanted to. If I was going to be a Christian and live this life, I wanted to actually know more about God, not just secondhand from what I had been told at church. I served a lot more in the church as often as I could as an intern, as a super volunteer, eventually as a paid staff member. I started tithing on a regular basis, which that one really blew my mind because that was just a whole leap of faith in giving of something that I didn't feel like it had very much of. I spent time in communities of believers, whether that was through a small group or just hanging out with a group of girls who loved Jesus on the weekends, because I wanted to be in that. I wanted to change my life and make serious steps and considerations towards what God's best was for me. I began my own process of sanctification. And guess what? I still messed up all the time. I would reach out to those friends who I knew weren't good for me because I felt like I was missing out on the fun. They would post about what they were doing on the weekends, and I was like, man, what a bummer. And then I'd go and hang out with them, and it didn't make me feel good. I usually felt worse and would think, why am I doing this? There's a reason I don't spend time with these people anymore. It breaks my heart to be around this. I reached out to that old boyfriend because I didn't know if I was going to find someone who, who loved me that well or that I loved that well. And that hurt him. That hurt me. It hurt him because I knew we didn't have a future together as evidenced by hearing Jesus tell me that there wasn't a future together. We were unequally yoked. I wanted to press into Jesus and he didn't have a faith at all. And so when I heard God tell me that there wasn't anything there, it was a mistake when I thought I could just pick things up and fix it. I'd even get frustrated about my church friends if I had spent too much time with the family members or the friends who didn't really like that part of my life. And I would think, you know what, maybe my family's right. Maybe it's just going to be a waste of my time to, to pursue Jesus and pursue ministry. I wouldn't make enough money. I won't actually be happy doing this thing. I messed up a lot, and I still mess up a lot. But I'm still working towards my higher purpose, still striving to be more like Christ, fully human and messy, but wanting to be better every day. Working through my sanctification one day, one hour, one minute at a time, we're all doing that, or at least that's the call of the Christian life. If we want to sit here and say we know Jesus, we have a relationship with him, then we have to be committed to working through the mess of our lives. To allow God to do work, to trust that he's guiding us into something better than we could ever imagine for ourselves. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished, on the day when Christ Jesus returns. I am proof that it is worth it to undergo the process of new birth. For every mess up that I've endured and heartbreak of leaving behind those, those relationships in my life, those things that I thought were good, God has given me more joy and love than I could ever understand or measure. He's redeemed my story in a lot of ways. He's given me a, a community of people who love Jesus and lift me up. I still have friends from the first church that I worked at, and, and they press in and they check in often. And I have people in this church who, who press in and check in often. How are you doing? What's your spiritual life looking like these days? How's ministry going? I have that sense of community that I needed. He's given me a job that is more than I could ever ask for. Coolest job ever. If you think you have it, you don't. I do. I promise you. It's really cool. He's given me a husband who loves Jesus and a second family through my husband who loves Jesus and lifts me up. I had people in my family who loved Jesus, but I was really needing that strong support system. I have an entirely second family who love Jesus, who pray over me, who give me words of wisdom. 
That's so cool. That was something that I didn't know that I needed and didn't recognize until I realized what was missing. He's given opportunity, even if it's only in small doses, to introduce the love of Jesus to those same family members who haven't supported me in this walk. Whether that's them saying, you know what, I caught your sermon on a live stream on Facebook. It just popped up. I'm really proud of you. Or the opportunity to pray with my father when my grandma was lying on her deathbed. I didn't offer to do that. He asked me to do it. Really cool stuff. And that's all because Jesus is redeeming my story. Because I said yes to new birth and new life with him. All because I committed to the uncomfortable parts of new birth and committed to knowing, you know what, I'm going to mess up and I'm going to keep doing it, but it's going to get better. And when I press into Jesus, when I trust in him, I get to see the fruit of that. Because he didn't just start a good work. He's seeing it through every step of the way. He loves watching me get better. He loves watching me press into him and ask for help and for guidance and walking through life with me. And he loves doing that with all of you. That's the beauty of the fact that we serve a patient God who sits there and he walks through our mess with us. 2 Peter 3.9 tells us, The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. The hope of the Lord is that all of his children would run home to him. That all would know and exclaim his name proudly. He's a good and a gracious And he sits with so much patience for all of us because he doesn't want us to be destroyed. He wants us to turn from our old lives, repent, and be a part of of this thing called new birth in his name. And he wants us to be a part of the ongoing process, which is why he's okay with waiting for the ongoing process. And he hopes that in our discipline, we become the same, patient. Patient for his mission, patient with the world around us as we carry forth the gospel to, to far off places, to the secular world where people don't want to accept it, so that the entire world will know that they are saved by the same patient God who says, it's okay that you're messy, let me help you through it. The third and final point in today's message is this, there is freedom in new birth. And this is a point that we can address pretty simply. It's short and it's sweet. Sure, change can be pretty difficult. The process of new birth can feel like a tremendous weight when it means turning away from what you once knew, but it can be freeing as well. I didn't know what I was missing out on when I, when I, stuck, when I was stuck in that life without Jesus being the center point, right? Grew up knowing him, but he wasn't really, he wasn't really the focus. But I didn't know what I was missing out on. I just knew, and I can remember being constantly tired. Because I was trying to do things on my own. I was searching for satisfaction in people and in my work, through social media, controlling my body image. If I could put, take control of anything, I would do it. Because I was hoping that it was going to make me feel good. Find meaning in that. And it was exhausting and unfulfilling. I wasn't the kind of person to ask for help either. I was just trying to do it all myself. I got it. Don't worry. You'll get through medical school. You'll, you'll carry that person through life when they're going through their struggles. And then in that moment that I shared with you, when I met Jesus face-to-face -face at Collide Summer Camp, I experienced my first taste of freedom. It looked a lot like sobbing on my knees, and, and I didn't know what was next, but I knew that I felt good. I was crying, but it was a lot of happy tears. I was overwhelmed at the thought that this could be a life that Jesus had for me. And sure, it was scary to walk into the unknown and, and make massive changes in my life, but for the first time, I wasn't doing that alone. I wasn't trying to, to shoulder the burden of life and find meaning on my own. It drove me to a relationship with God where I was asking him what to do on a regular basis. I no longer had to carry the weight of the world on my shoulders. I no longer had to search for satisfaction in people and, and my body image and, and whatever. Instead, I found satisfaction and self-worth in who I was becoming in Christ. I found freedom in a life with him because I didn't have to do it all alone. 
2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says, So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. When I read the Bible and hear the way that people talked about Jesus and his nature, the way he loved people and served people selflessly, it brings me immense joy to think that that's the person who saved me. That someone who was that good is the one who who saved all of us. And then when I read a verse like 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, so all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. When I hear that we can see and reflect the glory of God, that his Spirit makes us more like him, that brings me immense joy. What a breath of fresh air. How much freedom is there that because of nothing I've done on my own, thanks to to nothing I can do but everything that Jesus has done, that I have the opportunity to be like the man that they describe in the Bible who loved and served selflessly. That is freedom, to love like Christ. That we wouldn't have to wander through life looking for fulfillment, but that it becomes available to us in the moment that we say yes and commit to a life with him. So yes, new birth is necessary. It's necessary to our salvation. It's necessary to true freedom in Christ. We just have to be willing to work at it. So are you going to work at it? Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you that I am a work in progress, that you walk with me, that you see it through to the end. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that that exists for every single person in this room, every single person on this planet, intricately made in your image, that you sit patiently and you offer life with you and life to the full. God, in our mess and in our struggle, we just ask for your help. And Lord, if there's anyone in this room, if there's anyone watching online who hasn't accepted life with you, hasn't experienced the freedom of their new birth, I just ask that they would take that opportunity in this moment. That they would find a sweet place of peace and of comfort where they can just say, I'm tired of the way things were, and you know what? I might be a mess, but I'm willing to work through it because I'm, I want to be with you. I want to be with you forever. Jesus, we, we just ask that you would walk with us that in our struggle, that we would lean on you. And when we mess up, we would know that we have a father who picks us up and says, I'm going to dust you off, and we're going to get back to it, and it's going to be okay. Lord, we pray to be more like you, made in your image, continuing to work towards that common goal, change and growth. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.